So I'm so glad to be here, and it's the second time I've come, and that's actually thanks to Representative Kane, who has my personal email, and I was like, oh, I'm getting off the road, I'm not doing these talks anymore, and I got an email from her. I said, oh, of course I'll come. She's pretty darn great, and I'm sorry she's not here tonight, so actually this talk is thanks to her. So I want to thank Christine and Jen for inviting me and having me here and for their great introduction, and I, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the small amount of knowledge I have about the organization that they work for. Um, so I'm from Worcester County. I grew up here. I was born at Worcester Memorial. I grew up going to Spags. Who grew up going to Spags? Right? And Spags is so long gone, I don't even recognize that part of Route 9. I feel like I'm lost every time I'm there. So um, this talk is totally appropriate to the ages in this room, including some people who are on the young side. It's not going to go over your head because you're super smart. Um, there's some things I'm going to scoop by possibly quickly for that reason, but it's all good. I love the fact that I have students in this room. Uh, this talk is available to anybody who wants it, and I'm going to look at you two to say how that's going to happen. Often what we do is people sign up with an email out at the front desk, and anybody who wants the talk will email it to you. It's a giant Google Doc, um, so you've got to like, get it off Google. But you could take this talk. You can take this talk. She's been here. She's seen me twice, maybe three times. She could take this talk and go give it herself anywhere she wants. Don't give me credit. Just do it. But you want to practice a little bit ahead of time. So we're going to dive in. I'm going to tell you later how to practice. So we're going to talk about this extraordinary organ ensconced in your skull called the human brain. That's what we're talking about tonight. Everybody thinks they're going to stand, sit, sit here and hear me talk about heroin. I'm talking about brain and brain development and why it's impacted by substances that are addictive while your brain is developing. This has become a topic of conversation in many settings, and this is the covers of very common American magazines, Time Magazine, National Geographic, talking about the physiology of addiction, how the brain breaks when you expose it. And one of the reasons I have the slide up here is to acknowledge how mainstream it's become, but also because before you go give your talk, you want to read a little bit more. And online, particularly with that National Geographic article, there's lots of good video that talk about the complicated pathways that are disrupted. We're going to talk about the pathway that's very easy to understand and is true as the foundation of all substance use, and that is the disruption in the reward circuit of the brain, the part of the brain that says you've done a great job because you are doing this thing that is trying to keep you alive. The part of the brain that breaks with addiction is the survival part of the brain that tells you to wake up every day and find food and find water and find a mate because the entire purpose of us being here on this planet, the entire purpose is to send a, our genetic material forward, have a couple more generations ahead of us, and to keep them alive. Now, none of us think that way. None of us got up this morning and thought that way. Maybe one person did, but most of us go to work. We take care of our dogs. We love our family. We are athletes, all those things. But at the end of the day, this is really what drives us, is survival. And it's that part of the brain that breaks with addiction. That's the hard part here, because if we could pick up the disease of addiction, right, and you moved it somewhere else in the brain, you lost, it was in the visual cortex, and you lost your peripheral vision, right? I wouldn't let you fly a plane. You wouldn't get to pitch on the pitcher's mound. You would have special eye exercises. We'd figure it out, problem solved. But instead, the part of the brain that tells you to live or die, that is what breaks with addiction. And it is so important for us to acknowledge that this is truly a preventable disease, truly preventable. And it is so much easier to prevent this disease than to treat it on the other end, which is where I spend my day, is treating people who struggle with a substance use disorder. So racing through this reward circuit of the brain is that lovely neurotransmitter called dopamine. How does dopamine make you feel? Yeah, really good, super happy, euphoric, joyful. It has with it two specific behaviors, compulsion and perseveration. I have to do this. I am unable to stop thinking about doing this. And when it comes to survival, being compulsive and perseverating are really helpful characteristics. Those are the traits that allowed everybody in this room to exist. Your ancestors were compulsive and perseverating, right? That was good. This front row, mm -mm, their ancestors were not perseverating and compulsive enough. They didn't make it. Because to survive on this planet 200 years ago or 2,000 years ago was unbelievably challenging. You were hungry all the time, right? You were on that fasting diet all the time because you didn't have enough calories or protein, right? You had some food every three or four days. Hopefully you had access to clean water, but you went to bed every night thinking, how am I going to find enough calories to keep my family alive tomorrow? These were hard times, and that was 
for most of human history, right? So compulsion and per perseveration are helpful behaviors with survival. They define um, behaviors that have to do with addiction, and they're really frustrating. So who in this room um, is a therapist, a social worker, a, a nurse, a doctor, anything in the medical field? And, and do you sometimes work with people who struggle with a substance use disorder, right? Whether you wanted to today or not, you do, right? Those behaviors of compulsion and perseveration define their behavior. And I often have to take a breath and think to myself, this is just normal behavior that they're exhibiting, right? It's, I'm not mad at them. I sometimes get mad, but I try not to get mad. At a baseline, we all have a certain amount of dopamine in our brain. And on average in this room, everybody has about 100 units of dopamine. There's no blood test. Don't you call your family doctor tomorrow and get your dopamine measured, because that does not exist. But some of us are these happy-go-lucky, golden retrievers, feel better than average every day. And their baseline dopamine is like 106. Where's my golden retriever in this room? There's always several people, not many. Do I have golden retrievers who are happy? Oh, look at that. That's great. He's funny, Jen, I was gonna guess Jen was a golden retriever. I wasn't gonna call her out, but I had a feeling she had high dopamine. So in this room, about six or seven hands went up. That's great, lucky you. Most of us aren't sitting there. I actually have baseline low dopamine. I actually think I probably sit at 92 or 94 most days. And I know that about myself, I'm good, it's okay. What do people do in this room to make yourselves feel good when you're feeling kind of down? She reaches out and connects to other human beings. She talks to a friend. That is a great way to build dopamine. Making a connection to an animal or a human builds dopamine in your brain. What else do people do? Eat chocolate. Eat chocolate. A lot of us do this thing right here. It's either sugar or chocolate, or sometimes it's just food in general. Food gives you dopamine. Now, it's not always, not always a healthy dopamine, right? Like you can get a dopamine spike with lots of sugar, right? All day long, dopamine spike, dopamine spike. But who thinks sugar's good for your health? Right, my, my one guy, how old are you? You're eight or nine, yeah, okay. I totally agree with you. I wish sugar were good for my health because I love sugar and I have a sugar problem, right? But there is no health benefit to sugar. It's not good for you. We all know that. But who continues to use sugar almost on a daily basis, even though you know it's bad for you? Oh, no, not everybody. I bet there's somebody in this room who's off sugar. Is anybody off sugar? Anybody? Okay, one person right there. I'm not trying to point you out, but that's a tiny number. It's the point. We all use a substance that we know is bad for us, and most of us do it every day, and it causes us harm. I have arthritis, my joints swell, and sugar makes it much worse, and I still consume sugar even though it harms me, right? That's addictive behavior, it is. It's an addictive substance. So baseline dopamine on average in this room is 100. When you find the perfect food that's gonna keep your family alive, you get a spike in dopamine because your brain is rewarding you for surviving, okay? And your dopamine will go to 150 and then it will go back to normal. When you find a mate, you have sex, you send your genetic material forward, your dopamine goes to 200 and then it goes back to normal because this is a brain that is designed to make generations and keep them alive. That's how we have been for 200,000 years. When your brain is exposed to an addictive substance like cocaine, you spike to dopamine of about 350. When you use a strong prescription opiate, heroin, fentanyl, it goes between 500 and 1,000. And when you use a drug like crystal methamphetamine, it may go higher than 1,300. There's new crystal methamphetamine from Mexico that's ultra potent, and it's probably 1,600. Those are huge spikes in dopamine. So let's talk about it. Let's go deep into the, into the neurochemistry here. And no one gets quizzed. I'm not asking anybody any questions. But what controls the dopamine in the brain are three things in equation. How much dopamine is produced, how many dopamine receptors are receiving the information on the other side of the synaptic cleft, and how many little reuptake transporters are active, little vacuums that are sucking dopamine out, three things. Every addictive substance, every addictive behavior at the end of the day ends up here. It may have taken 14 steps to get there, but this is where it ends up. Cocaine is a drug that's actually very easy to understand because it really only does one thing. It just paralyzes the vacuums. It makes those little vacuums whose job it is is to suck the dopamine out of the synaptic cleft. It makes them not do their job. And so if the vacuums aren't doing their job, you start to build up dopamine in the active part of the brain. It goes to 350. And wouldn't you think this would be an easy problem to fix, right? I just need to make those little vacuums not hear the message from cocaine, but do we have good treatment for people who struggle with cocaine use disorder? Really effective, works all the time treatment? Mm -mm -mm, nothing. 
this is what my treatment is. Don't use cocaine. I got the big finger wag, like that's what I got. So this is something that people are working on. There, people talk about a vaccine for cocaine. It does not exist. It, they've had multiple trials and failures. Opiates or heroin work in a different way, and they go through a negative feedback loop to the GABA receptors, but at the end of the day, every opiate makes more dopamine and shoves it out into the active part of the brain. That's the way all the opiates work. We could do this with everything. We could do it with nicotine. We could do this with gambling. We could do this with marijuana. Everything ends up right here, okay? But I'm not gonna torture you. We're gonna cover these two. So let's talk about it for a second. Your brain for 200,000 years knows what a dopamine of 100 means. It knows what a 150 means. It knows what 200 is, because that is normal throughout the history of being in this human form. And when your brain starts seeing 350s, 500s, 1300s, your brain says, there's something wrong here. This isn't okay. This volume is too high. I need to downregulate. I need to turn down the volume. And your brain's response to these huge spikes, it doesn't happen day one, but it happens over a period of days or weeks. Your brain's response to that is to stop making dopamine, to erase 80% of your re receptors on the other side and to turn on every vacuum in sight. So when people struggle with addiction, they wake up in the morning and their new dopamine is a 40 or a 45, right? They're miserable. And I'm not talking physiologic withdrawal of having goosebumps and achy bones and vomiting. Their brain does not have anywhere close to a survival level of a critical neurotransmitter. And their brain is screaming at them. There's something wrong with you. You need to fix this. And how can you fix it? What's the fix? Continue to use, right? Continue to drink. Continue to seek out whatever that thing is that you know is killing you, destroying your life, destroying your relationship with everybody in your life. Yet your brain is actually making a rational decision. It is desperate to feel normal. And it's a devastating place to get where the thing you're doing continues to destroy you, but yet it's the only thing that makes your brain normal again. It's this concept of you broke your brain, right? This is how people break their brain. They didn't mean to do it. If they knew it was gonna look this bad eight years ago, maybe they wouldn't have done it, right? But we're gonna talk about how many of us start with a substance use disorder. What I really wanna talk about though is something that likely happened in Shrewsbury this morning, okay? This is a guy who lives in town. He probably lives down the street from you. He is 63 years old, and he woke up this morning at 5.30 with crushing substernal chest pain, and he's rubbing his sternum, and his partner looks at him and says, you look terrible, and he says, no, I'm all good, and she says, I'm calling an ambulance, and by that time, I got ambulance, I got fire, I got a couple patrol cars, I got everybody in this guy's living room, right? It's now 5.35 in the morning, and they look at him and say, you look terrible, I think you're having a heart attack, I'm not positive, but I'm going to treat you like you're having a heart attack. I'm going to give you a sublingual nitroglycerin, you're going to take a baby aspirin, get a beta block or big bore IV, I'm going to take your EKG, and I'm going to send it to St. Vincent's, and St. Vincent's looks at that and says, mm -mm -mm, don't send him here, right? Let's call the cath lab at UMass, forget that. Let's send him to the operating room. This guy ends up with his chest cracked and a quadruple bypass surgery. He's on a post-surgical floor for a week. He's on telemetry for a week. He gets some depression. Lots of time and money is spent on him. He goes to outpatient cardiac rehab at St. V's for 12 weeks. He gets all better, right? How much money did we spend on him? Yeah, what's a lot? Somebody said 300,000. I think it's a pretty good guess. I would say between 250 and 300,000, about a quarter million dollars, I think is about the right amount of money, okay? His next door neighbor, right next door to him is this young woman, and she graduated from this high school. She's 24 years old. She graduated from this high school. She got to be a soccer player on the most spectacular athletic fields I've ever seen in my life. Um, and she was first generation. Nobody in her family had ever gone to college. She got a soccer scholarship to Boston College. She's smart, she's hardworking, and her sophomore year at BC, she tore her ACL badly on her right knee. She couldn't play soccer, she couldn't run, she couldn't kick, she couldn't do anything, and she tried so hard to rehab and get better. Two surgeries later, nothing was working, and um, she lost her scholarship to BC. She couldn't afford to go there anymore. She had to drop out, and the only thing that made this kid, who felt like she was a, sh a shining star flying into the universe, the only thing that made her feel better again, feel normal again, is when she took the five milligram oxycodone pill that her orthopedic surgeon kept giving her. 
right? She finally felt normal again when she took that. Now, she'd had some history of depression and some other things, but at the age of 19, where all these terrible things happened to her, her life really began to go off track. And every terrible thing that you never, ever want to have happen to your niece or your daughter or a loved one happened to this kid. For the last five years, she's been off the rails. But nine months ago, she moved back home. She stopped her, her what she was doing. She moved back home. She's living with her family. She is going to a local Suboxone clinic. She has a therapist. She's exercising again. She's not a, a collegiate athlete, but she's still an athlete. She goes um, to AA meetings. She has a new job that she could just got two weeks ago. She got paid yesterday. And this morning at 5.30 in the morning, when that mom knocked on that bathroom door to get her girl off to Starbucks, there was no answer, and the door was locked. And that mom freaked out kicks the door in, finds her 24-year-old daughter lying on the ground, blue and not breathing. That mom has been around the block. She has Narcan or the drug overdose chemical naloxone at home and she administers it, but her daughter doesn't come back to life. This mom always calls 911 first because that's the first step. And by that time, I have two Shrewsbury patrol cars in her driveway, takes four more vials of Narcan before this young woman comes back to life. And they bring her to the St. Vincent's ER and what happens to her? Yeah, stomach doesn't get pumped. She doesn't, there's nothing in her stomach, right? The way she used the heroin is not involved the stomach. Somebody said nothing happened to her. Who thinks nothing happened to her? Yeah, I think probably not much happened to her, right? They may have said, do you want to go to a treatment bed? They may have said, here's a trifold pamphlet with 14,000 numbers on it. Go call, make some phone calls. I guarantee you they made her feel bad. I guarantee you they gave her a big shot of shame and blame and made her feel like a dirt bag because that's what we really, we're really good at that in medicine. I'm a doctor. Like I, if this room were filled with doctors, I would still be having the same conversation. Doctors are really good at making people feel like they're not taking good care of themselves. Okay, let's go back to my guy, her next door neighbor, 63 year old guy who we just spent a quarter million dollars on. I didn't tell you his full story. Both of his parents had significant cardiovascular disease. His mom died of a stroke at the age of 70. His dad had a heart attack and died in his 50s. He used to be a two pack a day smoker. He's good, he's gotten better. He's down to one pack a day of, ni of nicotine. And he kicks back, I don't know, eight beers a day, 12 beers a day. He's not so sure how much he drinks. His favorite drug of choice though is fast food. He goes to McDonald's three or four times a week. So does this guy have addiction? What's he addicted to? Yeah, you guys covered it all, right? I heard alcohol, I heard nicotine, I heard unhealthy lifestyle, fast food, sugar, salt, whatever chemicals are in fast food that make you addicted to them. He's an addict, right? He is an addict by anybody's measure, right? But did anybody, when they were in his living room, when they was in the emergency room, when he was in the operating room, did anybody make him feel like a dirt bag? Did anybody say, first of all, let me ask, did this guy cause his heart attack? Yeah. Oh yeah, he did. I know I told you about his family history. Both of his parents are smokers. You get rid of nicotine in that family, there's no cardiovascular disease. The number one killer in our country is tobacco use. Number two killer in our country is lack of exercise and poor diet. And number three is alcohol. He partook and partakes in the three leading killers in our country, right? He absolutely caused his heart attack. But we didn't deny him care. We didn't not offer him treatment. We didn't say, we're going to give you nothing. We're going to kick you to the curb. Instead, we did everything we could to save his life and make sure he had all the support that he needed to live a healthy life in the future, right? Yet his next door neighbor, that 24-year-old woman, we gave nothing to, nothing. And you know what that kid needed? She needed a great nurse, a great like ward clerk, a, a, a medical assistant to look at her and say, I talked to your mom in the waiting room and she told me how great you're doing. That really for the last nine months, you've done everything you could to get well. And you know what you did today? You had a single use and it nearly killed you. And you know what I wanna to say to you? That is not just common, it's normal. I hate when it happens, but it's to be expected. And I want to talk to you about what has changed in your life that has allowed this to happen. What do we need to improve for you? Did you stop seeing your therapist as often because you have a new job? Did you get paid yesterday for the first time in a long time and had money in your wallet that burned a hole in your pocket and you had to spend it? Like, let's explore how I can build a safety net that's better for you, right? 
That cost how much money, my friends? Zero dollars. Nobody needs a shot of shame from the medical world, from any of us for struggling with addiction. Most of us in this room, if we're willing to really acknowledge it, have family members, loved ones, neighbors who struggle with addiction, right? In the days of us making people feel bad and stigmatizing people for this, we need to move beyond this. The reason I do this work is this slide here. This difference between the care we provide to two human beings makes me crazy. And this chasm between these two human beings has to close. Okay, let's go back to the science. These are PET scans of the brain, right? Coronal slices of the brain when seen on a PET scan. And that, that middle column are nice, healthy brains. And what you see there is the orange. The orange is dopamine, right? That, those all look like many of us in this room. And the brains on the right are people who struggle with a substance. That top one is cocaine. The next one down is crystal methamphetamine. The next one down is alcohol. And the final one is heroin. And when you look at that column, the ones on the right, you can see there's not a lot of dopamine. It just shows what I already told you. The dopamine system gets broken in a profound way. If you squint because you're in the back, look at the alcohol, which is the third one down. What is kind of surprising about that is how much orange is still there, how much dopamine is still racing around. Alcohol is a really damaging drug to humans, to society. And I will never underplay the bad role, the deleterious role that alcohol plays in people's lives. It does. It may be common. A lot of us may have a drink today. A lot of us may actually be functional alcoholics. Um, the brain breaks in a much slower fashion with alcohol than other substances. It doesn't make it better. It doesn't make it any less harmful. It's just that a lot of us get by as being functional alcoholics for a lot longer before we lose our job, we get our third OUI, and our husband walks out on us. It takes a while to break the brain. So there's three things that can set you up for addiction. And the reason I'm in this room here at a high school is because in this room is I, I have parents, I have teachers, I have grandparents, and I have students, right? And the reason that we're going to spend so much time here is we're going to talk about the fact that this is truly a preventable disease. There's three things that can be a setup for addiction. The first is genetics. The second is early exposure while your brain is developing. And the third one is a history of childhood trauma. Having poor mental health does not mean you're going to necessarily struggle with addiction. The problem is that when you have poor mental health, and I'm going to say it now, I'm going to say it uh, later, our kids, our children's generation is struggling with levels of anxiety and depression like nothing we have ever seen before ever. And it's not one of these things where we now recognize anxiety and depression more and so we're naming it more. I actually think, and I think most people in the room would agree, our kids are under so much pressure from the entire universe, right? That the levels of anxiety and depression are out of control, skyrocketing everywhere. And the notion that you have in this town, an organization that actually provides treatment and counseling to our kids is amazing. This is one of the biggest shortages we have in the entire state and the entire country is getting help for our kids. And the problem is when you are 14 years old and you're crawling out of your skin with anxiety and the only thing that makes you feel better is when you smoke marijuana, what you are is a person who struggles, who is self-medicating with an addictive substance. So you become a brain that has early exposure. So it's the self-medication for a mental health disorder that leads to the early exposure that leads to addiction. And it is critical, right? If I were to flip things on their heads, I would be spending tons of time and money as a public health agency getting people's mental health needs addressed. That should be the priority, right? That should be our priority. I know there's all these cool cardiovascular things that happen. My husband's a family doctor. He works here in Worcester. And he was, he was telling me about a patient yesterday. And he said, they're doing this really cool thing through the carotid that I've never heard of. And then I hear him getting online and watch the video. And it was super cool. And then he's like, but it doesn't work any better than the tried and true way that we've been using for 30 years. But I guarantee you, it's going to cost 10 times more money, right? We spend a lot of money on subspecialty work that may not improve anybody's life, that may not keep anybody alive, yet we pay therapists no money at all, and you try to get a therapist for your kid who's struggling. How long is the wait for a good therapist, my friends? Right? You have a kid who in front of you who's a mess, who's cutting themselves, who's failing out of school, that is an emergency. You should be able to get a therapist tomorrow because that kid is in crisis. It doesn't work that way. Genetics of addiction are really, really powerful. And I'm just sorry to say that, but it's a fact. If you have a parent or a grandparent who struggles with addiction, you have about a 50% chance of struggling yourself. 
Now, why does it matter that you both know that, but more importantly, that your kids know this? Because your kids get to make choices that can change this outcome, right? Kids will sometimes come into my office and be like, my great aunt had colon cancer. And I'm like, don't you worry about that. That's too far away. I have no idea why, but it's not gonna necessarily impact you. But what I think to myself is, wow, that kid knows about their great aunt's colon cancer, but do they have any idea about the substance use disorder in their family, which I know about, because I'm a family doctor. I take care of everybody else in the family. This is a thing you really wanna to talk to your kids about. It is. And that may feel really uncomfortable to you, but when I sat down with my three kids, I didn't go into the gory details of the who and the what exactly. I said, you know what, three of my lovelies in front of me, we have a strong family history of substance use. It, you guys are vulnerable. You're more susceptible than the average bear based on your genetics. And in order for you to avoid this, you need to do the next thing really, really well. We know that all addiction starts while the brain is developing. It is a pediatric developmental disease. If you can get to the age of 24 not having used an addictive substance, you're not smoking, you're not drinking, you're not using marijuana, you're age 24, the likelihood of you developing addiction is about 2%. If you have genetics working against you, if you're my three kids and you have genetics already working against you and you postpone your use until age 24 or 25, the likelihood of developing addiction goes down to 5%. It's not as good as 2%. But 5% compared to 50% or higher, that is awesome. And that is the reason your kids need to understand what their genetic risk is. Because they can change the outcome. They literally can get to change their genetic makeup, right, through the epigenetic shifting. That's amazing. If I told every kid, if this room were filled with Shrewsbury high school and middle schoolers, and I said, you will never get cancer if you do this one thing really well by the age of 24, everybody in the room would basically do it. They would sign up because people live in terror of cancer, which I understand. But I'm telling you, as somebody who takes care of people who struggle with addiction, Boy, it is a deadly disease that kills a lot of young people at much higher rates than cancer does. What's the average age of first use of a substance? First use, nicotine, alcohol, or marijuana. What's the first age, roughly? Yeah, it's 12, 13, or 14. So it's sixth, seventh, or eighth grade, first use. So if you think the first time you should have a talk with your kids is when they're in 10th grade, what are you, crazy? Absolutely no way. This is really, quite honestly, ready for this? This is at least a fifth grade conversation. But you should talk to your kindergartners because that will be crazy to you, but this is a conversation for a kindergartner. Sweetheart, if you ever see a pill on a ground or something you think is a pill, you get an adult. That's a drug talk for a kindergartner because you know what? Common pills, metformin, lisinopril, will kill a five-year-old. It's very easy to overdose on iron supplements when you're a child. So that's a drug talk for a kindergartner, right? You're not talking to them about cocaine. Of course you're not, that's insane. But a pill on the ground, you get an adult. I don't care who the adult is, you need to tell them. I don't care if it's a Tic Tac. If you think it's a pill, get an adult. So really, fifth grade is the time to have a conversation. And we know, we're gonna get to the vaping in a bit, younger and younger ages are experimenting with the vape products. So if you are 15 years old and you start drinking, and drinking here is defined as two alcoholic beverages a week, the age of 15, 40% of those kids go on to be alcoholics. If you wait until age 21, 7% go on to be alcoholics. It's just about postponing use. That's all it is. Just postpone your use. That's all. I know that seems like too simple an answer. And maybe some people are like, there's no way my kid is going to postpone their use. But I actually think that's not true. I sent a kid, my, one of my oldest kid, off to college many years ago. And I said, look, colleges are filled with alcohol. It's a lot of drugs. Um, and I know you're an 18-year-old kid. And you know, I know what many people do at the age of 18. You don't have to do that, though. You don't have to be at a frat party drunk every weekend. That doesn't have to be the choice you make. You can make a different choice. Right? Because what do we know about frat parties and a lot of drug people? A lot of people are harmed in those circumstances, right? Whether they are, they are the assailant or whether they are the assaulted, it is most often done under the influence. And what if one third of our college kids showed up at every frat party and said, you know who I am in this room? I'm the sober one that's going to make sure everybody else in this room is sober. Right? I'm going to say to you, you know what? You are too drunk to be hanging all over that girl. So you're going to come with me because you're not safe to make good decisions tonight. Right? I really believe that empowering your kid to be a knight in shining armor is well within everybody's capacity in this room. Your kids should know basic CPR. They should know um, 
basic Red Cross, and your kids should know what I'm describing to you. When I talked to my kid the first day of college, I said, how was it? I didn't talk to him for a while. I was trying to leave the kid alone. After the first week, I said, how is it? And he said, well, I spent my first night of college in the emergency room. And I was like, oh, I'm the worst mother ever. I didn't even call him. And he said, I said, what happened? He said, I went to my first frat party. I said, uh-oh. And he said, and there was a kid who was so drunk, he blacked out, and I knew he wasn't safe back in his dorm room, right? He brought him back to his dorm room, put him on his side, make sure he didn't vomit into his lungs, and then he realized he wasn't safe for that. So he called an Uber, maybe not the best decision, but anyway, called an Uber and brought him to the emergency room and spent the night with him. Probably seven nights of his college career was that story of this kid was so unwell that I had to bring them to the hospital. My kid was not special. My kid just was empowered to know that you may need to step in and rescue others from their bad decision. And our kids make the best choices of any generation we've ever seen. In spite of the vaping epidemic, which makes me insane, our kids make great choices. And they just have to be learned and be told that actually not using substances is actually the norm. It is the norm. 70% of our kids aren't using anything. But that 30% man, they take all the oxygen out of the room. It's all anybody talks about. Okay, back to our kids making great decisions. If this room were filled with middle schoolers and I said, what do you think of tobacco? What do you think of cigarettes? What would they say? Well, let me stop. Let me ask my very back row. I have a lot of young people in the back row. What do you guys think of cigarettes? They're bad. Anything else? Stinky? Okay. Does anybody think they're great? They're awesome? They're cool? Yeah, this generation, they hate tobacco, they hate cigarettes. They were going to eradicate the entire tobacco industry because this young generation has been so well taught by public health that this is a dangerous drug that is the number one killer in our country. And oftentimes the kids are like, they're disgusting, they're horrible, they paralyze the cilia and your sinuses and your lungs, they're the number one cause of bladder cancer. Their knowledge about the harm of tobacco is through the roof because this is a generation who learned it well and is disgusted by it. We had gotten to the point where about 2% of high school seniors Years were smoking. They were that smart, that good. How, you know, do you guys know who Joe Camel is? Anybody in my back row? Yeah, did you guys see that? Back row. Don't know who Joe Camel is, right? Joe Camel is this disgusting cartoon figure that used to sell cigarettes to my generation, right? Everybody else knows who Joe Camel is. How proud are you that they don't know who Joe Camel is? That is public health messaging gone right, right? Again, we're going to get to the whole juuling, vaping, e-cigarette world in a bit. Okay, kids think cigarettes are bad for them, so they stopped using them. But here's the rub. Kids do not think marijuana is bad for them. So as they think the harm is low, the use has gone up. So what do our kids say about pot? It's natural, it's organic, grows in the ground. Yep, what else? No big deal. You did it, it's no big deal, you're fine. What else? It's legal. Of everything that's about to be said, this one over the age of 21, it is legal over the age of 21. I'll give you guys that. What else? It's not addictive. Yep, kids always say it's not addictive. What else? It helps me. It makes me feel better. It helps me sleep. It helps my anxiety. Whenever I stop it, my anxiety and sleep is terrible. It's medicine. Cures cancer. Stops all seizures. At the end, let's, go do, let's talk about CBD at the end, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save that for questions if you guys want to talk about CBD oil, okay? There's one other one. If I were the head of the debate club and I said there's one good argument you can make, there's one thing kids always say, and they compare it to another legal substance that causes harm. Yeah, this is, this is the effective debate club one that I don't disagree with. It's better and safer than alcohol. This is the argument they'll make. And I'm like, well, I think alcohol is really harmful. I don't deny that, right? So let's dive in. You guys covered them all. You got them all. Everyone. Okay. So this is what our young people think. The smartest generation we've ever had believes all of this. So let's talk about how the brain develops. Our kids um, have brains that are changing every second of every day, starting at the moment that they are conceived. And between the ages of 12 and 24, very important things happen to the brain. Incredibly important things are happening every single day in this high school. So the first thing that happens is something called synaptic refinement. The brain has 
billions, tens of billions of neurons racing through the brain at the age of 9 and 10 and 12. It is a hot, tangled mess inside that skull. And what must happen during adolescence is you need to prune it back. You need to get rid of stuff in there because it is a hot, tangled mess. That's normal. It's not atrophying. It's not a failing brain. It is a brain that's trying to figure out what do I need to hold on to? What can I get rid of? So there are times during adolescence where you are losing 30,000 synapses a second. There's times I look at my 17-year-old daughter and think, you're losing 30,000 synapses right in front of my very eyes. That's how I think. So this is critical. It must happen. The second thing that happens is myelination, or unsheathing rapid highways in the brain that make you help make good, fast decisions. So our kids' brains are absolutely fabulous and normal and pushing the limit all the time and live on an incredibly wide spectrum of emotion. This is a normal brain. This is a brain that is desperately trying to figure out what do I need to hold on to? What do I need to get rid of? And that's why they are teenagers that do things that make us as adults nuts. I'm a parent. I have two teenage girls at home and my brain sometimes is going crazy because these tend to be act first, think later. Very, no consideration for negative consequences. Very heavily influenced by others. There's never a time in your life where it matters to you what other people think as much as when you're a teenager. Everybody in this room can recognize that, right? When you were in second grade and you're all by yourself at the age of seven in the elementary school cafeteria, you don't even know you're all by yourself. You don't even care. You're eating your sandwich. You're drawing a cartoon. You do not care. And when you're 24 and you're at your first job and you're sitting by yourself, you're like, I hope nobody sits with me because I don't want to talk to anybody, right? I just want to read the New York Times on my phone. Leave me alone, right? But when you are a 14-year-old kid and you're by yourself in that school cafeteria, every single I in the entire universe is looking at you and you're wondering, what's wrong with me, right? What did I do wrong? Is it because I'm stupid? Is it because my hair looks bad? Is it my bad sneakers? Is it because I said that idiotic thing in math? You don't know, right? You are so self-absorbed when you are a teenager, right? It's just who you are. The entire world is all about you. It is the nature of it. And I'm not saying anything bad about my amazing kids in this room. Their brains are normal and we have to work with this incredible brain. This is known as the looking glass self. I always have to turn around and read it because I always screw it up, but I'm not who you think I am. I'm not who I think I am. I am who I think you think I am. This is the reason why most of us in this room would not go back and relive middle school or high school. Every now and then there's one person, three people in the room who are like, yeah, I'd go back. Most of us would never go back and it's because of this. I have somebody who possibly is in high school. It's like, yeah, I don't even want to go back tomorrow, right? <laughs> so if I have an adult in the room who's still like this, who really it matters so much, in fact, the only way you see yourself is through somebody else's eye, you need a therapist because you have got to grow out of this way of being. And one of the reasons I argue that our kids have such high rates of anxiety and depression is because social media has amplified this thing times a thousand. You're not just in middle school with your 122 classmates, which was bad enough. You're online with like 120,000 people who are judging you and you are comparing yourself to them, right? It's middle school times, maybe 10,000. It's terrible. And I wish I could take my kids' smartphones and throw them in the lake. I hate them. I think they've really harmed our kids. I don't have any way to do that. I wish somebody could tell me of a smart way, but I feel like that horse is so far out of the barn, these little personalized computers that are glued to our kids' hands. Three things happen during brain development. We covered two. The third one is the final shell of the brain is completed, right? The cortex or the outer part of the brain gets completed. And that is where you lay down all those dopamine receptors. That is why all addiction is a developmental pediatric disease and starts while your brain is developing is because that is when the dopamine receptors get laid down. What becomes active during this time is a naturally occurring neuroendocannabinoid called anandamide. And we don't quite understand this one. I went, I went to Yale. Yale is very known for their neuroanatomy and neurophysiology. And I went back through my notes to see if I even, if I missed this lecture, which I did not. Um, but this was not mentioned because this has been relatively recent in discovery. So anandamide's job is to help decide um, about the pruning or getting rid of stuff. It also is in charge of joy in the brain. The problem with this naturally occurring neuroendocannabinoid is that it is the mirror image to THC, which is the psychoactive cannabinoid in pot. And your brain can't tell these two things apart, it sees them the exact same way. 
not only does it see them the exact same way, but it actually has a strong preference for THC. THC is a more potent drug. It locks itself into that receptor and boots the naturally occurring one out of the way. So it's like using a sledgehammer to determine how your kid's brain is going to develop instead of a scalpel. I believe that the THC that is in all marijuana that is sold um, is a neurotoxic drug to the developing brain. What you do when you're an adult, as long as you hurt nobody else and you're not driving on my roads and you're not taking care of my children or operating on my knee, I don't think it's worse than alcohol. I will give them that. But while your brain is developing, this is a neurotoxic drug and this is no enhancer of performance. It's a performance degrading drug. So um, it has an effect on attention, verbal learning, memory, processing speed. This is one of the better studies out there in the world because it was a study that followed people over about 30 years. And in this study, they looked in a community in New Zealand at the entire town and they compared a group of kids who had used marijuana zero times during adolescence to a group of kids who had used marijuana 400 times or more. And adolescence here was between the ages of 14 and 21. And then it followed them to the age of 35 and said, how'd your life go? Or how are you? Things good? So we're going to compare the two <coughs> bars. I'm going to do the extremes, the gray bar on the top of three charts and the red bar on the bottom of the three charts. The gray bar is never used. So graduating from college by age 25, if you used marijuana zero times, you graduated from college 36% of the time. If you use marijuana 400 times or more, you graduated from college 2% of the time. 400 times is a big number, but I want to be clear about this. 400 times in seven years is using it once a week or less. It's not that much, okay? Graduated from college 2% of the time. Having a job by age 25, 21% of the kids, I'm sorry, unemployment. This is unemployment measure. So 21% of the kids who never used marijuana were unemployed. 52% of the kids who used marijuana 400 times or more were unemployed by the age of 25. I like my kids. I love my kids. I want them to leave my house. I don't want them in my house. I want them to go to college and get a job and pay taxes and walk their own dog and do their own breakfast dishes. I don't want them living with me when they're 25. That's my personal belief as a parent. That for me is success. Goodbye. So the same study showed an eight point drop in IQ by the age of 35. That's two standard deviations. That is a significant loss. Now here's the problem with this study. It was based on the old marijuana. It's based on the marijuana available in the 1980s and 1990s, which was 3% THC or less. Today's marijuana field grown in any place in Massachusetts or any place in the country is sitting between 9% and 18% THC, right? There's no more 3%. That doesn't exist. That's a rare seed in some vault somewhere. It doesn't exist, not grown, doesn't exist. The way our kids use marijuana is often not just the field grown stuff. They use the concentrates where the THC is extracted from the flower. And this sits between 50 and 90% THC, hash oil, shatter, butter, glass, any of these things, 50 to 90% THC. You think your kid's brain is better when it's exposed to a 9% or a 90% THC? You think you're improving IQ? This is a neurotoxic drug on steroids. And for us to sit here as the state of Massachusetts and say, it's fine, make it legal, right? and act as though there will not be public health consequences for this. You guys have learned one thing tonight, right? Addiction starts while your brain is developing. And if your job is to sell an addictive drug, who's your audience? It is kids. They're not going, I'm 51. I'm not their target audience anymore. They can't get me, but they can get that entire back row. That's their target. And I'm not being like conspiracy theorist here. This is just a fact. So if you guys were rewriting the rules, what would be the age you could walk into a pot shop? Yeah, I would say 25 or 26, right? That would be, I think, a better idea. Do you guys think there should be a limit on THC? Like, how strong can you make this stuff? Should there be a limit? Yeah. Is there a limit? No. 
So the number one thing that gets sold, first of all, lots of ways you can use pot. You can smoke it, you can vape it, you can rub it on your skin, you can use it as a tincture under your tongue. There's a thousand ways to get it into your system. One of the more common ways is wrapped in sugar and chocolate, right? So we're gonna mix it in with other addictive substances. We're gonna make it really something that every kid would want, right? This is stuff from Colorado. It's been changed. Colorado's no longer allowed to sell look-alike candy bars like this. But I was sitting in an auditorium like this five years ago with a state trooper who'd gone to Colorado and brought these things back. I don't know how, he's a state trooper, I guess he could do what he wanted. And on the back of all of these candy bars, every candy bar was 12 servings and they were all about 70% THC. So can you guys imagine taking something like a York peppermint patty or like a Kit Kat and breaking it into 12 pieces? And putting 11 pieces in a bag and eating one corner, right? And who's gonna do that? That's crazy town, right? That's crazy town. So Massachusetts has no limits on anything. Massachusetts, in fact, the ballot measure very specifically said you must sell edibles. Now we did say you could not sell a lookalike candy, but you can sell four bars wrapped in chocolate of a, of a, of a cracker thing. Everybody knows it's a Kit Kat, right? Um, the labeling is very deceptive and there is no limit on THC, no limit. So I don't know, you guys have already moved the age to 25. What limit should there be? How high do you need to get? I don't know, I don't know, 20%. I think 20% THC is super high enough, right? That's what I would have done. And the, a smart state would have done it that way. That's what a smart state, you know what I'm so mad as a Bay State resident? Because we are a smart state and we let the marijuana industry run this show because there are billions of dollars at stake in this market. So is it addictive? Well, we used to say it wasn't so addictive. We used to say back in the old days with this product that no longer exists, that when you started when you were adult, it was about 9% addictive. When you started when you were a teenager, it was higher than that, 17%. Today's marijuana, because of its potency, is between 30 and 50% addictive. It's more addictive than nicotine. So welcome to our fine state where there's a marijuana store not far from you, right? This is not a good thing. And do you think kids are getting pot from our local stores? You don't think so? I don't think the local stores, no, because they're, they're pretty regulated, I think, going yep. in. So it isn't that they walk in and buy it. It's that somebody walks in and then goes back and sells it to them. So it isn't that the salesperson at the local store sells it. I agree with that. And how do we know? Well, because when the medical marijuana stores opened throughout, we began to find medical marijuana throughout the high schools. I knew those kids weren't going in. They didn't have cards, but it gets sold to them. And can you buy marijuana of all sorts online? Of course you can. You can buy anything you want online. So our kids have access to this. It's going to be a hard thing to turn off. Okay, let's talk about alcohol. I said I was not going to avoid alcohol. It is so common. It is part of so many people's daily life. A third of Americans never, ever drink anything, not a drop of alcohol. A third of Americans drink very little. A drink a week, a couple drinks a month, very light use. And a third of the rest of us drink all the alcohol in the entire country, all of it. And the final 10% of us drink at least 10 drinks a day. 10% of the parents in the school drink at least 10 drinks a day. 10% of the people you work with drink at least 10 drinks a day. 10% of the people on the roads tonight, 10 drinks. Okay, that's a lot of alcohol by anybody's measure. No one's like, oh, sign me up. 10 drinks seems like a good idea. This is the trick though. It doesn't take much to get to 10 drinks. So who is a bartender? Who is a bartender? Are you bartenders in the room? Previous bartenders? There we go. So you're making a mixed drink, okay? And a definition of one drink is 1.5 ounces of hard alcohol. In a mixed drink, how many drinks might there be? Two or three easily. So you go to a bar and you get a mixed drink, so you just got yourself to two or three, okay? You end up with two cocktails, so you just got yourself to five or six, okay? Just to do the math, just gotta, you gotta add them up and be honest. That's all I say to people. So I do this all the time. I say to my women, Tell me about your relationship to alcohol. I say it to all my patients, but I focus on my women and they say, oh, you know, I have a couple glasses at night. And I say, oh, what are you drinking? I drink wine. Well, how much do you pour? I, drew, I pour a normal glass, right? I pour my giant mason jar on a stem of, of wine. And I'm like, mm-hmm, okay. So this is what a glass of wine is. It's five ounces, that's it. And what I say to people is, I need you to put five ounces of water into your giant goblet and acknowledge that's a glass. And then I need you to ask yourself why you're pouring a 15 ounce glass of wine and having really six drinks every night. What is that about? Because it's not good for your health. And um, most of the time we're self-medicating, right? Many of us come home after a really hard, tiring 
cruddy day at work, and many of us uncork a bottle of wine or pop the top of a beer bottle, and we drink, and our kids see us do this, right? They, I walk in, I'm like, I've had a terrible day, glug, 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 right? The message you send to your kid when you do that is when you're miserable, when you're down, when you're overwhelmed, you should drink, because that'll help it. That's not a message we meant to send to our kids, right? None of us meant to do that. And instead, most of us need to walk in the door and be like, I've had a terrible day. I'm going to go exercise. I'm going to go walk the dog. I'm going to go lie down on a mat on the floor and go listen to John Cabot Zinn on my phone because I'm miserable and there's healthy ways to make myself feel better instead of self-medicating. I myself have struggled with this. I used to leave. I had, I've had lots of, I actually haven't had that many jobs. I have a lot of jobs. And there was a time where I would leave work and my brain would say, I can't wait to have a drink. For two weeks, I experienced that thinking. And then after two weeks, I said, oh my goodness, what just happened to me? Where am I? What is happening that I need to drink to make myself feel better? And now my rule is if my internal voice says, I can't wait to have a drink, I don't get to drink because I'm self-medicating, right? I have to do something else. I will say this to my women in this room. We are drinking like no one has ever seen a woman drink in the history of womankind. No one is drinking like we are, and women are affected at a much younger age, at much lower amounts of alcohol. It is not a healthy drug. The days of us saying, have a glass of red wine, it's good for your heart, there is no health benefit to alcohol. Stop pretending there is, no health benefit. So if you like the way it tastes and you can drink in moderation, fine. But if you find yourself drinking every day and having a hard time not drinking every day, you need to acknowledge that and maybe walk away. I think more of us as adults should be having parties where there's no alcohol. Your kids need to see that. Alcohol should not define who we are. Okay, so here's this thing. Parents say to me sometimes, but I want to teach my kid to drink, right? Before they go to college, I want them to know their limits. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's not a good idea because we've done studies on this. So when parents provide alcohol to their kids, what happens, they have much higher rates of alcohol use disorder and binge drinking. So their brain is not different at the age of 17 or 18 before you send them off to college. Don't provide alcohol to underage people. It's illegal to provide it to other people's kids. If you think you're doing good to the world by hosting some after football party at your house, I hope the police come and shut you down, right? You are not helping anybody by giving them alcohol. Your rule with your kids should be, I will rescue you in any situation, any time, in the middle of the night, even if you've been up to something that I don't really approve of, because I want you to be safe and I love you. I may be mad at you, but at night, I won't say a damn word. I will zip my lip that entire drive home. I will try really hard to do that for you. And I will rescue you and your friends out of any circumstance. Let's get a plan for that. But um, the other thing, this is what people say to me all the time, is they say they drink fine in Europe. They're all good in Europe. There's no alcoholism in Europe. They start drinking at 12. And I was like, okay, let's look into that. World Health Organization, top 25 countries in the world that have alcohol as a primary disorder, top 23 are in Europe. Two of the 25 aren't in Europe, but every other one, one is a European country. South Korea and South Africa are the only two on that list. The alcoholism rates in Europe are through the roof. The United States is actually quite low in comparison. Okay, I'm going to breeze through this just because of my ages in the room, but I said there were three things that can be a the setup for addiction. Genetics, early exposure while your brain is developing, and a history of childhood trauma. Growing up in a family that's neglectful, harmful, abusive, has an impact on who you are and how you are in your disease states for the rest of your life. There's no longer a time where we can not acknowledge this. This all comes from the ACE study, but this ACE study has been replicated again and again. Who knows about the ACE study in this room? Yeah, you know, it's the year 2020, actually. And in this room, less than 5% know about the ACE study. It's always a surprise to me. This is a study done in 1996 to 1998 in San Diego County. And in this study, they asked 10 questions about harmful things that might have happened to you as a child in your house. I'm not going to run the list just because of my age in the room, but it's stuff that is bad stuff that happens to all of our kids. Not all of our kids, but a lot of kids in our country and in the world. And if you scored on a scale of 0 to 10, greater than a six or six or higher on the ACE score, you just took 20 years off your life expectancy. If you score a four or higher on an ACE score, you have much higher rates of heart attacks, asthma, COPD, multiple broken bones. You're at very high risk for developing addiction. And guess what? This is the part your kids don't get to control. They don't get to control the household they grow up in. They don't get to control what happens to their bodies. 
right? This is the thing that us as society, as teachers, as guidance counselors, as aunts and uncles can help protect our kids from. It is so important to have kids be loved and protected. That is the way we are designed, we're wired to be. And when we grow up and we're not protected by people who are supposed to love us or we're put in dangerous, violent, harmful situation, it causes damage. Okay, three things, genetics plus trauma plus early use. You don't need all three, you need just one, sadly. And the one message, besides the fact that all addiction is, starts when your brain is developing, talk to your kids. Don't avoid this subject, talk to your kids. You know the best time to talk to your kids? When they're trapped in the car with you, they cannot get away from you. Talk to them, okay? Tell them your genetic history, tell them to postpone their use, tell them, um, our kids respond to the science of this. They really do. I have all this stuff is online. You can watch videos on this. Your kids should know this stuff. Okay, so our kids, smartest decisions ever. This goes back to 1992, but they're graphs that go back to the early 70s, which is when we began collecting data. So we have 40 something years of data. Rates of alcohol use in our teenagers down to such low levels. Marijuana is flat. All the other substances are actually really flat because our kids are super smart. And then this thing happened, right? Our kids were gonna eradicate cigarettes and instead this giant industry that was convinced it was helping people, the e-cigarette vaping thing came about because they said, you wanna get off your cigarettes? I'll help you get off your cigarettes. Use my vaping product, right? So at this point, um, about a third of high school students are vaping. Um, the numbers are probably plummeting right now. We're gonna talk about what you guys already know, why that is happening. But this thing came out of nowhere. And in fact, it really was in September of 2017. I don't know who works in the schools, but I remember showing up in the schools in September of 2017, and we were finding vape pens and e-cigarettes everywhere. Something happened that summer that went viral, and the kids came back and they were using heavily. Um, the thing about vaping is it's not just nicotine, that more and more we're finding vape, vaping with THC. And the potency of the THC in many of the vape pens is greater than 50%. So this isn't low potency THC. These are kids who are very discreetly getting high in the back of history class or in the bathroom in this high school with THC. Nobody wants that as a parent. If I said to you, there's a sophomore who's showing up in school drunk with nips in their pocket, you would all freak out and say, that's not okay. This is not okay either. So THC is absolutely on the rise. It all is all interchangeable little tiny cassettes that attach to the e-cigarettes. Um, so a couple years ago, I said to my youngest kid, I must have been ranting and raving about the vape pen. I said, let me put that in context. I was sure I was ranting and raving. She said, mom, you're so crazy. It's not a big deal. And I said, why do you think that? And she said, the only thing in there is water vapor and flavor, right? How many of your kids have said that to you? Anybody else? Right. And guess what? She believed that hard, right? She said, there's nothing in this stuff. And I said, that's not true. They're lying to you. They're telling you that, but it isn't true. And at that time, a month earlier, a good study had come out that bought 70 American-made refill cartridges for the e-cigarettes, all of which were labeled zero milligrams of nicotine. And they brought it all to an independent lab and got it tested. And what percent of these zero milligram nicotine products had nicotine in them? Yeah, 90%. I love you guys, 90%, okay? Some of which had the equivalent of a pack of cigarettes of nicotine in them. They're labeled zero milligrams of nicotine. Our kids think they're fine and they're watermelon and they make a fun dragon cloud that's fun to blow through. But instead, they were getting addicted to nicotine and most kids did not sign up for that. Most kids honestly didn't think they were gonna get addicted. This is an industry that remains entirely unregulated because that's what unregulated industries do. So Juul began its marketing campaign in 2015, and I don't know, do you think that's intended for the average truck driver who's trying to stop smoking, right? That looks like one, my youngest daughter. That kid is my youngest daughter. This was a marketing campaign that was on Snapchat and Instagram. It was going along with like makeup for middle schoolers. This was an industry that was intent on hooking our kids. And our um, attorney general, along with many other attorney generals, are suing Juul specifically for this reason. 
So Jules didn't lie. I will give them that credit. Jules said, we're filled with nicotine. They never said they didn't have nicotine. They said, we're chock-a-block full. These things are super fun. They're cool. They feel good in your hand. They have that really smooth plastic like an iPhone. The box they come in feels like my iPhone. Like I opened and closed my new phone case like seven times because it felt so good. There's something that's very high tech about this that our kids love. It was designed this way. So jewels are the equivalent to a pack of cigarettes. Everybody knows that. They're actually more potent than a pack of cigarettes because of the type of nicotine salt they use. So people get really addicted to these. I have patients who have to sleep with the jewel under their pillow because they have to vape in the middle of the night. They cannot get through the night because they are in nicotine withdrawal. So super addictive. Um, you guys know this, and this is the one thing I guess we have going for us. In August of 2019, E-Valley, which is this um, very significant lung disease associated with e-cigarettes and THC cigarettes, really became prominent. Everybody knows this. Thousands of people have been diagnosed with it. There have now been how many deaths? Oh, I don't remember the number. 60 deaths, maybe? Um, but the most important thing is that these were young people. These weren't 80 year olds who were dying. These are young people. These are young people at the age of 29 who needed lung transplants. This was freaking people out. And all of a sudden, a bunch of teenagers were like, oh my goodness, I am hooked on this e cigarette. I cannot stop, and I don't want this to happen to me, right? So that's a real problem. And why, when Jen said in the beginning, you guys have the only known statewide program in Shrewsbury that's trying to help kids get off their addiction to nicotine, that's amazing and awesome. Because punishing their kids for their nicotine addiction is actually not the right approach. They have an addiction. They need treatment. You walk into your average pediatrician's office and say, how do I get my kid off e-cigarettes? What do you think the answer is going to be? Yeah, they're going to be like, I'm not sure because I'm a pediatrician who takes care of kids. I don't normally have to deal with nicotine addiction. Nicotine addiction is for mostly for adult doctors, right? If you walk into your family doctor's office because they cover kids and adults, they may be like, look, let's do nicotine replacement. We'll decrease it over time. Well, butrin, which is well studied for both nicotine and we use it in kids all the time. We could try that too. Like, we're going to give you something to help wean your kid off of this addiction. Um, I'm going to skip that slide. So Massachusetts really, here's, we were not smart on marijuana. We've been really smart on this. So before any other state did this, thanks to Charlie Baker and great DPH in Massachusetts, we have banned all flavored cigarettes, all menthol cigarettes, all flavored anything. That's Massachusetts. That is a great thing. Is anybody have, used to smoke menthol cigarettes? I don't know. You can't find them in mass. Yeah, you can't. They're gone. They're all gone. Everybody's gone now. It's all good. They're, and I've been saying for years, if you just ban the flavors, the kids will not use it because the stuff tastes disgusting. All you needed to do five years ago, two years ago, was to ban the flavors. That's all it would take to solve this problem. Yet Massachusetts, they're the ones who did it, right? And actually some other states have followed. So this is the problem is that the federal government, um, has said, well, we will ban the flavors because we should, it's gonna work, but it's a partial ban. And they have, not, they have specifically not banned disposable e-cigarettes. So this is the market. Kids don't jewel anymore. Jewel's so old school, nobody's doing that anymore. Kids are using this other brand or many other brands that are disposable e-cigarettes filled with nicotine and they're all flavored. So if you can make a disposable e-cigarette, you can use as many flavors as you want. So the entire market is now this. It's now both profoundly unenvironmental, super addictive, and our kids are going to continue to use it. So the federal government, they're a bunch of idiots. They, they needed to ban all the flavors, ban it all now, right? And they didn't do it because the industry lobbied really hard because there's a lot of money at stake here, right? You, we should all feel really rotten about this, rotten about this. I really thought the federal government had banned the flavors, and then I looked at it and I said, they, oh, they hadn't, right? They only banned the permanent e-cigarettes, but not the disposable ones. Did you guys know that? Yeah, not okay. In Massachusetts, it's all banned, but who cares? Because you could drive to Rhode Island and get it. You could order it all online because there's no boundaries. Okay, smartphones, have they destroyed a generation? Of course they haven't destroyed a generation, but they've caused a lot of harm. This is a really helpful article to read. Again, everybody who wants the slide deck can get, get the slide deck. This is an Atlantic Monthly article. It has some podcasts, but it talks about the harm that these smartphones have done to our kids. Um, half of kids in the US and Japan say they self-report that they're addicted to their phone. Who in, 
this room thinks they're addicted to their phone? Yeah, a lot of us have phone problems, right? We have, we have issues. We're thinking about our phone right now. Some of you have gotten a buzz that may be a buzz. It may not be a buzz. You have the phantom buzz. Like you're thinking about your phone. The more I talk about it, the more you want to touch it, right? This is the reason it took a long time that Massachusetts has banned all touching of a phone in a vehicle, is that we know it's not safe. We know this. Yet even me, and I try to be a good person, I'm a terrible person. I'm on my phone in the car. Now I'm not because I don't want to get a ticket, but it took that, it took that law to pass for me to not touch my phone. So there's a lot of fighting between parents and kids about their phone, just a lot. Who had fights with their kid about their phone? Yeah, I, I used to, I just gave up now. Now I'm just a terrible mom. I don't know what they're doing on their phone. I hope they're not doing, I don't know what to say anymore. I've lost control. I just lost total control as a parent. So this is a thing. 56% of parents admit to checking their phone while they're driving. 72% of teens and 48% of parents feel the need to immediately respond to texts and postings, right? This is the definition of addiction, compulsion, continued use despite harm, having cravings and a loss of control, right? So it is not good for our kids. It's definitely not good for the adults. This is my girls. This is Instagram and Snapchat. And they'll say to me, why didn't you give me a heart or a like on something? And I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about. The only reason I follow you on Instagram is to make sure you're not up to some crazy business. But you know, you get a little dopamine spike every time tell, somebody tells you they like your post, right? All of us do this. All of us, every one of us who's on Facebook, right? We have a number of people who follow us and like, and it hurts your feelings when somebody doesn't respond. These are little tiny dopamine spikes all day long. And you think the tech industry does not know this? The tech industry is designed to make you addicted to your device. It is designed that way. We gotta acknowledge that one. Okay, let's talk about opiates, because I can't be here and not at least cover this topic. So there's no doubt the pills are on the hook for this one. The over-prescribing of prescription opiates for about 20 years started the epidemic. They're not the problem now. They're, they have not been the problem for a while, but they started it. We prescribe more opiates than any other nation in the world by a long shot. You think Canada has less pain than we have? Of course they don't, right? Of course they don't, except in this country, there's a pill for every ill, right? We want to solve all of our problems with an easy prescription, but that's not the solution for most problems. So as everybody knows, more people now die from opiate overdose than any other cause of accidental death, more than motor vehicle accidents, more than gun violence, more than AIDS at the peak of the AIDS epidemic. It's the number one killer under the age of 50 is opiate or drug overdose. This is not the place we want it to be. It's a terrible place in 2020. Um, well, this map, I have a thousand maps, I only pull up a few, but this map just shows there is a correlation between where pills were prescribed heavily and where people died. That's not a surprise to anyone. What I want you to look at is us. Look at us in Massachusetts. We actually were never a big pill prescriber, never. We were ranked like 44th in the country in terms of pill prescriptions. So where did this stuff all come from? Well, between the year 2000 and 2010, we used to call I-95 Oxy Highway because Florida, which had 652 pill mills, had a business where you could walk into anywhere. There would have these buses that would go to Florida and you'd have all your room paid for and your meals and your bus transportation. And you would walk into two pill mills a day. You had cash, you handed over the cash. You walked out with a giant bag of pills and a stack of scripts, which you handed to your tour operator who went back to Kentucky and Maine and Massachusetts and sold them. For 10 years, 10 long years, this happened. And in 2009, the federal government looked at the state of Florida and said, you have impacted the entire eastern seaboard with your pill mills, and we are going to shut you down. 2011, they shut them down. I think there's two left in the entire state. Shut them down overnight. 34 doctors went to federal prison. They're still serving time because they weren't doctors, although they were doctors trained in the United States. They were drug dealers. They were making between 10 and $20 million a year. So what happens when you have 2.5 million Americans up and down I-95 addicted to opiates and you just shut down the pipeline? Yeah, what are they going to look for if they're looking for another drug? Heroin, right? Heroin was here already. We had it. We had it in small numbers, but it, why, it spread pretty widely, pretty fast. And this stuff is much more potent, much more dangerous, and much cheaper. 
So we did the right thing in shutting down Florida Man, but we were not prepared for this. In 2010, 2011, 2012, we had no idea that this train was barreling down right towards us, and we were not ready. And I know, because I've been there, watching it all unfold. When I, I was in Boston, moved back home, got to Franklin County and said, who's helping people with addiction? And they're like, nobody. And I was like, okay, well, everybody I'm seeing is struggling and uh, I don't know what we're going to do, but we need to figure this out. I was a baby specialist. That's what I did. Babies, birth control, women's health. That was my specialty. And then all of a sudden, this is all I do now is I help people with addiction because it had to happen because it's such a prominent problem. So after the bottom map is between 2000, 1999 and 2010, and these are states where overdose, the red states are states where overdose was high. After Florida got shut down, the states really start to light up because heroin is so much more potent than the pills. Now again, don't hear me wrong, glad Florida got shut down, but we were not ready for this disaster. In 2016, fentanyl arrived. It arrived in the fine state of New Hampshire, the fine state of Massachusetts and Ohio. How did we get so lucky? Can't tell you. But fentanyl took over in 2016 and starting in the beginning of 2018, it was clear there was almost no heroin left. Most everything out there is fentanyl or fentanyl positive. So 90% of the product out there is now a hundred times more potent. We are dealing with the most toxic supply of drugs available that we've ever known in history. And it's terrible. For 10 years I've been working on this project and I most days don't think we've made a lot of headway. Lots of advances have happened, but people are still dying at really high rates. It takes that much fentanyl to kill you. So how are you gonna stop that? What's your plan to stop that? It's crazy. You can't stop it, my friends. You can't shut down all the factories that are making this in Mexico and China. You can't stop the delivery of products to the country via FedEx or UPS. There's no way to shut this down. I'm not trying to be hopeless, but this is not a law enforcement fix. We need our young people to never, ever want to use this stuff. It's going to be sort of a generational thing. So this is overdose rates. The, the maroon states are where it's high. The gray states are not not high, they just didn't have any reporting data to give us. But you can see, it's what you guys would have predicted, where the states are who are most heavily hit. Pennsylvania, that state's been heavily hit. But it's us, and we're it. Let's talk, talk about us in the state of Massachusetts. This, the, about three weeks ago, DPH came out with the most recent data, maybe it was five weeks ago, and they said, yeah, we've had a decrease in opiate overdoses, and every time they do that, I'm like, okay, I love that you guys are patting yourselves on the back. I love DPH, the state has worked so hard on this issue. But the truth is, for the last three years, we've had a pretty steady rate of overdose. It hasn't decreased that much. It's within a margin of error. So you can see, it's pretty flat. Lots and lots of Massachusetts residents are still dying of opiate overdose. When when you look at the state, the red counties are where overdoses have increased. The green counties, or sorry, towns, not counties, the green towns are where there's been a decrease. Look at Worcester. It's not okay that this is happening here. It's not okay. It's not acceptable. I work in the Springfield, Holyoke, Chicopee region right now. They have had a 100% increase in overdoses. I've had three times the rate of overdoses in the last two years in Franklin County where I live. So Western Mass and Central Mass has gotten hammered. If Boston takes its foot off the accelerator on the opiate epidemic because they're all looking good in the Boston area, I'm going to kill them, right? Because Central Mass and Western Mass needs continued attention because I have friends and neighbors and patients who are dying. How do our kids get exposed to opiates? By and large, thank goodness, they don't, right? The old days of searching through somebody's medicine cabinet to get some oxy somethings, those days thankfully are gone. And if you have a bottle or seven of Xanax, uh, Valium, Oxycodone, Oxycontin, Vicodin, hanging out at home, shame on you, shame on you. You should not have that stuff. If you're actively using it, it should be kept under lock and key. If you have some old bottles hanging around, take them to the police department. Shrewsbury has a police take up back box. Everybody has it. Nobody should have that in your house. And you should go check your parents' and grandparents' house because I had to go through lots of cabinets in my own family to get rid of it all. When I do a home visit on an old person, I'm like, I'm just gonna go through your medicine cabinet for you. I'm gonna clean house a little bit because you gotta get rid of this stuff because you don't want an accidental exposure. By and large, our kids are not using opiates. They're terrified of them. Thank goodness for that because they're a deadly drug that destroy your life. Where do they get them? They get them from a prescription. 
They get them when they break their femur, when they get their appendix out, and when they get their wisdom teeth out. So these days, how many opiates might be prescribed for a wisdom tooth extraction? Does anybody have a story, recent, a recent story? Anybody have a wisdom tooth extracted by a kid? Nobody yet? You guys have kids who are young. Yeah? Did you have one? And how many were, did they, were they prescribed any opiates after the procedure? How many? Twelve. And how many did they use? Okay, her answer was twelve. And I said, how many did she use? And the answer was zero. 12 is the average. Oral surgeons and dentists on average in Massachusetts now prescribe 12. That's based on 2019 data. How many did they used to prescribe? 30 or 60. Her daughter used zero. The average use after your wisdom tooth is out is about two. Because I, I survey people all the time. A lot of times people use zero. Tylenol, Motrin, distraction really works. Listen to some music, put your headphones on, put an ice pack on your face. It's amazing how well it works, right? So most oral surgeons should be prescribing too. How do you control that? Well, you don't get to write the prescription, but you can look at them and say, hey, I don't want any. I'll call your office if I'm in trouble. Somebody's on call for them, I guarantee you that. Or you can say, I only want two, and if I need more, I'll contact you. And let's pretend you've gotten that 12 because it was pre-printed and handed to you in a package. You didn't get to talk to anybody. You can go to any pharmacy in Massachusetts and say, I don't want all 12, only fill the two. And it used to be the case that the rest would get wasted, but a new change happened. I don't remember, January, somebody in the room will remember this, where they actually don't waste the extra script. They'll hold on to it. So if your kid struggles, you already took your two, and they're a mess, and they got you know, dry rot or whatever's going on. They're a mess, and they've taken their two. You can go back to the pharmacy and get two more. But then you're limiting what your kid is exposed to, and you're limiting what comes into your house. So this is good public health intervention. So my recommendation to my adults who love their kids is you look at the person who's taking care of your kid and say, I do not want them to be exposed to opiates. How can I help treat their pain while limiting their exposure? And at this point, most prescribers in this state should have a ready answer for you. Yep, we're going to use a combination of Tylenol and Motrin. I'm going to write out exactly what I need you to do. And then we're going to use other techniques to help distract your kid. Massachusetts prescribers have gotten so much better at this. But as the, at the end of the day, us as parents have to protect our kids. If you love somebody who struggles with addiction, you need to have Narcan available. You need to have it available. You need to know how to use it. Your family members need to know how to use it because it takes one use to kill you. And so I carry Narcan all the time. I know how to use it. It's, is it easy to use Narcan? Yeah, it's like Flonase up your nose. It's a squirt, right? What if you find somebody down on the ground, blue and not breathing? What's the first thing you do? Call 911. You always call 911 and you start basic CPR. Now, what if you give Narcan to somebody who's not having an overdose? Will you hurt them? Mm -mm. You will not. Now, what if they were on chronic opiates for another reason, for pain? Yeah, they're going to go into withdrawal, right? But that's a very small number of people. So if they're on the ground actually having a seizure and you don't know the difference, you've called 911, you've started basic life support, and you give them Narcan because they're having a seizure, you will not hurt them. You will cause them no harm. You will not be sued because we're a good Samaritan state. It is better um, to recognize that somebody is blue and not breathing and use Narcan than to not. People get better with addiction. I know I'm being a negative Nancy up here, but people get better. Every day I see people who are better, every single day. And it doesn't take one thing to get better. It takes a lot of things to get better. And when I sit with my patients, I will often draw a circle and say, there's a pie here. Many, many pieces of your pie must get, come together for you to get better. And on everybody's pie, in order to get better, they need to live in a place that is sober. They need to live in a home that is not, does not involve substances. And this is a hard thing to come by, right? I take care of a lot of people who are homeless, right? They don't have a home at all. And it's really hard to get better when you're living under an underpass. It is a very hard thing not to use. Um, what else does it take to get better? Oh, a whole bunch of things. A sense of purpose, having a job, having people who you love, who love you back. Um, medicine, I'm a believer, big believer in treatment for opiate use disorder, methadone, buprenorphine, naltrexone, I don't care what it is as long as it works for you. I don't judge any of that. You could be on it as long as you need to be on it, as long as it works for you. Uh, I believe in 12-step programs if they work for you. Treatment for trauma really matters to get people better. But it's not that there's one way to get through this. There's many ways to get better. And we need more of this available to our people. There's lots of great books out there on substance use, and I would recommend any of these books. The book at the bottom that's yellow in the middle is called High. 
And it's written by the guy who wrote um, Beautiful Boy and Clean, David and Nick Sheff. Nick is the son, David's the dad. Who in this room has read Beautiful Boy? Yeah, I would say it's the most common. Who saw the movie? Let me see the movie. Yeah, how was the movie? It was great. I couldn't see it. It was too painful, but I heard it was great. The book is great, too. It's a great book. I would say every parent should read that book. It's a, he's an amazing writer, um, David Sheff. He's a journalist. This is a good time, if you're never going to get the slide tech, to take out your phone and take a picture of the screen. So that book in the middle bottom high is intended for teenagers. It's written by them, but it's intended to help kids from ages 12, 13, and 14 and up understand how their brain breaks with addiction. It's a great book. Um, it belongs in this library. I quite honestly think there should be a book club at every high school that reads this book. I think this should be a book that's given in biology class. It's really, really good. So my own high at my house, I've read it multiple times. Um, the book Hey Kiddo is written by a great Worcester guy. Did anybody read Hey Kiddo? Hey Kiddo's great. It's a graphic novel about a guy from Worcester whose mom was a heroin addict and he was raised by his grandparents, which is a very common thing in our society. Lots of kids are being raised by their grandparents. It's often a norm. And uh, he had a tough life. He had loving grandparents, but they were kind of tough too. I love that book. And it's just as a Worcester native, it's, it's a great read. Anybody else read any of these other books? What have you read? The Body Keeps the Score is the best book on trauma I think that has been written. Are you a therapist? Are you a doctor? No, OK. It's a great book on trauma. And if I have people in this room who are caregivers of any sort, therapists, teachers, guidance counselors, nurses, doctors, the body keeps the scores in assigned read reading. You've got to read it. And it talks about how trauma breaks the brain and how you can possibly get better. It's a great book. So these are great. I have a website. It's just my name. I'm going to go back to the book picture in a second. But it's just my name, ruthpotee.com. And on that website, I post articles. If I read an article, I think, oh, that was interesting. I post it on the website. There's video. So there's a, this gets videotaped. And then it gets posted on YouTube. Or I don't know where it goes. But I do post some videos from these kinds of talks there. So if you ever decide, I'm going to go give this talk to my middle school. I'm going to be the bravest person in the world and stand up here in front of, in front of a bunch of middle schoolers. Watch the talk a couple times again. Take the slide deck and add or take away what you want and run with it. Because the more we're able to talk to people about this, the better we will be as society. I am going to take questions. And Christine has a mic. I am going to repeat the question if the mic isn't on, though, so that the camera can pick it up. Does anybody have questions? So she said, I've been learning more about ADHD and comorbid conditions. And she didn't ask a specific question, but do you mind if I dive in like I think I know what your question's going to be? OK. ADHD is attention um, deficit hyperactivity disorder. Statistically speaking, about 7% of American children have ADHD, about 7. Sometimes the number's 5. The problem is, in some communities, the diagnosis of ADHD is like 12%. 15%, really high. And I think to myself, really? Does Cohasset really have 15% ADHD? I don't really think so. That makes no sense to me. It needs to be diagnosed very carefully and very critically. And if your kid has ADHD and has been diagnosed by a clinician, a neuropsychiatrist who's done a lot of testing, or psychologist, or a doctor, your kid really needs treatment. And when I say treatment, treatment is many things all at the same time. They need class accommodations. They need a 501. They need an IEP. They need more time to take their tests. They need to not have that distracting neighbor that is always poking them. They need to get moved away. Like There's a lot of classroom changes that have to happen. I do think that food and sugar and caffeine and chemicals in our food can make ADD worse. I am also a believer in prescription drugs to help our kids who suffer with ADHD. Because one of the, this is what I will say. The correlation or the overlay between addiction and ADD is quite high. One third of people who have an adult diagnosis of a substance use disorder also have ADHD. One third, that's a big number. So people say to me, well, what came first? Maybe they got addicted because you gave them Adderall when they were 11, right? That's what we sometimes think. It's a very complicated analysis, though. So, Untreated ADHD is one of the highest risk groups to self-medicate. When you are 11 or 12 and you're kind of nuts with your ADHD and you have no friends because you've ticked off everybody in your class and you lost privileges yet again because you can't help yourself from being a blurter, you just can't help yourself, it's really hard to be that kid. It does not feel good in that kid's body, right? And that is a kid who will do anything to feel better. And the number 
there's two drugs they're going to turn to first. The first is nicotine. Nicotine is a stimulant, and it helps focus you a little bit. And so it's actually treatment for ADHD self-medication. It's nothing I would prescribe ever, but it helps these kids focus. And so they turn to nicotine at a pretty young age, and all of a sudden I have a 12-year-old who's smoking a pack a day. That's terrible, right? Nobody wants that. And marijuana is the other one that they'll turn to. So treating the kids who truly have ADHD, I think, is really important. Getting rid of the kids who don't really have ADHD because their parents think these stimulants are performance-enhancing drugs and they're going to go to Harvard, that's crazy town, right? Don't do that to your kids. Don't think they're performance-enhancing drugs. The studies are very clear. They will not make you better, smarter, or better test taker. They will help you if you really have that diagnosis. So work hard to get your kid a good diagnosis. My guess is this school system probably does a pretty good job of helping kids figure that out. You guys are in sort of a medical mecca where you can get good evaluation. Um, not treating your kid who truly has ADHD puts them in harm's way. And I spend a lot of time telling parents that, like really you're causing your kid harm by not treating them because they're gonna find some way through this. What other questions do people have? Yeah. So I'm so glad she asked this question. She asked the question, what's the neurologic difference between CBD and THC? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip it a little bit. Marijuana has a hundred and something, maybe even more than that, cannab cannabinoids in it, most of which we can't even name. There's gazillions of them. Don't even know, right? They're all some complicated chemical. There's one that's THC, and then there's all the others, okay? THC is the one that makes you high, right? The other ones don't. They just don't. Hemp, when you grow just the hemp plant, which is a sibling plant to marijuana, but it's not marijuana, hemp, by definition, is 0.03% THC. Does anybody want to correct me on that? I'm pa What was that? Okay. So it has a tiny smidge of THC in it, just a tiny bit, right? But the, otherwise, it's all CBD other stuff, okay? So that's from the hemp plant. Now, as I showed you, there's no marijuana plant that has no THC in it. It all has THC in it. And that rare plant of 3%, that one's gone. So every marijuana plant starts at whatever it is, 9%, 8% THC. And again, it's the THC that's the psychoactive get you high part of the brain that disrupts the developing brain. So what do we think about CBD in kids? Well, I'm a believer in science. I believe things should be studied in a placebo-controlled way to show us the benefits of everything. I do not prescribe medicine in my office that has not been studied. Most of my life I spend prescribing medicine in the 1950s that's been studied for 70 years, right? We know the effects. It ticks me off when people are like, I bought this at GNC and it's going to make my hair grow and make me smarter. And I'm like, none of what you purchased has been investigated by the Food and Drug Administration. All these supplements that people take, eat food. Eat healthy food. You don't need a vitamin. Stop it. Unless you have some reason you can't absorb food and there's nutrients, nobody needs a supplement. What if you're too poor to buy nutritious food? Then maybe you need a supplement. But for many of us in this room, we can afford fruits and vegetables and water and some protein. We're fine. So supplements are not investigated by the Food and Drug Administration. Good supplements have been tested in an independent lab and they have a, that seal is on the bottom. You should never buy anything that doesn't have that seal. So let's go back to CBD. CBD is not investigated by anybody. There's no studies that look at it. And more importantly to me, you really don't know what you're buying. So I would love to have a gazillion studies that look at it, real studies, not sort of like my mom took it and it cured her pain studies. I want real studies that look at thousands of people and use the same product and compare it to a placebo, okay? So for some people, it seems to help anxiety and it seems to help pain, whether you're taking it orally. I'm talking about the straight CBD here. Whether you take it orally as a tincture or, as a, or you use it as a cream, it can help people. That's great. But my attitude is this concern about buyer beware. So another study came out that bought, uh, I think the number was 82 American-made CBD products from a hemp plant. That's what it said on the packaging. And it brought them to a lab and said, tell me what's really in this. And a third of it had what it said in it. It was 100% or whatever it is, 99.7% CBD, very little THC. A third of it had nothing in it at all at all. You spent 50 bucks for your thing and it had, it was basically olive oil. And then a third of it had a whole bunch of THC in it. I'm not good on that. I am not good on a product that gets sold for a lot of money that nobody has investigated. 
It's not okay. And why the FDA has not stepped in? I don't know. I know why the FDA hasn't stepped in, because it's not a legal drug federally, right? So please buy it carefully. Know your source. I always ask people, show me the independent lab that tested your product. Show that to me, please. And if I don't have it, I don't buy it. I only know of one CBD product that's been tested in an independent lab. And if you really want to know what it is, I'll tell you after. I have no financial stake in anything. I kind of don't want to promote them, but they are independently checked. So know your source. Might it help you? Maybe. Would I give it to a kid? Not until it's been studied in kids. I won't do it because we think kids are, things are safe for kids. What do we know? We know nothing. Okay, what other questions do people have? If you want the slide deck, you're going to sign your name up. Yeah, question in the way back. If you shout it out, I'll repeat it. I love that you're saying, I feel the same way you do. It's crazy, it's crazy. Because marijuana is a harmful drug, and if I really only thought that the, the ultra adults would use it, it wouldn't bother me so much, but that's not who it's intended for. It is being marketed to our kids, and our kids have a sense it's all good all the time, and the science doesn't show that. It is just the way it was with tobacco in the 1910s and 1920s and 1930s when doctors showed up in their office smoking their camels saying, you should smoke cigarettes, it's good for your lungs. That's what we used to tell patients. And then lo and behold, it's the number one killer in our country. So I think in 20 years, your brain's going to be like, I was right, they were wrong. Because in 20 years time, we're going to be following what happened to this generation with heavy exposure to marijuana and think, what were we thinking? And states will have to go back and be like, the age of entering into a store is 26. The limit on THC is something. I don't know what that number is, but we're going to limit the amount that you can have. Um, in Europe, they have a limit. In Europe, this high potency pot doesn't really exist. Now, I'm sure we'll ship it over to them, but right now it doesn't exist. But I appreciate your frustration. You know what? Be mad. Keep fighting. I'm never happy when a pot store is opening. I don't think it's good for our society. Okay, loves. Um, how about this? Let me take questions afterwards because it's late. I know you guys need to get home. You need, kids need to do their homework. But thanks for having me for a second time. I really appreciate being here.